Welcome to the second talk in a row about malware. Pretty excited to be here, second year uh, at CypherCon presenting. If you guys were at my last talk, hit me up afterwards and make fun of it, this one too. My name is Robert Lerner. I am a manager of a bunch of really cool security guys over at Rapid7 um, doing some cool stuff. Visiting from Texas, nobody cares about this part of this, but uh, grew up in Chicago, so I got the sport in the Chicago wear. Um, but yeah, warmer weather, not as, not as crazy there. So what am I doing here? Back in 2021, I had somebody post on Reddit, everybody's favorite website, a piece of code. And their SAST uh, word fence had detected some malicious code that was inside of somewhere inside of their uh, WordPress directory. Massive shock. Uh, so they wanted to know exactly what this code was doing. They went and got the typical Reddit, re uh, Reddit replies where you get the downvote. They just keep on scrolling. It's obfuscated, so it must be bad, which is a really bad premise to go off of because there are a lot of things in non-compiled languages like PHP, which is what this talks about, sorry, uh, that try to hide what a script does to make it harder to reverse engineer. It looks dangerous, so don't double click it. A lot of that stuff going on. And then you get the atypical Redditor responses, which is why I have like 14 or 15 banned accounts in the past month. You contact the original poster, you spend a week figuring out exactly what that code actually did. So what is command and control? It's basically software which allows a command and control of a server. So you could list file system, uh, run file system commands, list directories, wget or curl down additional files. So if there's a constraint to an upload form where you could fit a small piece of code, you could use that to allow a pull down of something else from another site. Pastebin raw is a great place to upload things or GitHub raw where you could pull those files down to a local directory and then execute those. Um, RMRF, everybody makes that joke at security conferences and I'm no different than those people, so here it is. Also allow you to create, read, update, and delete files on disk like databases, SSH keys, um, FERPA, HIPAA, not HIPPO, um, as well as access intellectual property like uh, bill of materials, trade secrets, web books, and the like. In August, in the Wisconsin Center, where the owner of a Penske truck with an Indiana plate was Okay. Plate, two, eight, six, three, four, four, three. Your truck needs to be moved immediately. That plate again is. All right, so pro tip, I told a few people here that if my talk sucked, pull the fire alarm. I thought that's what was happening. <laughs> uh, so anyway, maybe, <laughs> we'll, keep, we'll keep on going. Um, so what we'll do first is we'll go ahead and write, write, a, write a web shell. Right? I'm going to give you a heads up. You don't have to take pictures of every slide. The bad thing about doing that is I would be in them and I'm not that handsome. But you can. Otherwise, I'll have a GitHub link at the end, which is already public, so you guys can get to it. You don't have to wait until I like release secret source code. It's not mine anyway. Minimum viable product of a web shell is less than question mark exec in a request. All you're doing is saying PHP execute this at, at the shell level any request that comes across. Now there's a few differences between what request is. You got your git, you got your post. Bad thing about doing git is say, you're one of those people who runs your own web server at home. This is really cool, right? If I want to get a malicious script from my own host, I might send a request to my hacks.php question mark hacks equals my website, wget there. That's gonna be in their access logs. They're gonna know exactly who you are and what you're pulling down from their git logs, right? If you send it as a post, a little bit more abstraction here. That's not going to be in an access log. It's going to be nowhere. So this is a pretty great script from a perspective of it's very small, and it does everything you pretty much need a web shell to do. But if you were to look at that, whether you wrote in this language or not, it's probably pretty obvious. I mean, it says hacks directly in it. So how you would leverage this is you would take it and put a question mark at the end, hacks, and then command line parameter. Now, if you are running your uh, running your applications through a DAST, Dynamic Application Security Test Tool, it's going to find that because it's going to throw an LS in there or something similar and see a directory listing come back. If you're using a SAST, it's going to see exec, which isn't bad. It's probably bad, but it's not necessarily bad. But it's going to flag that as like, hey, go look at this. 
So again, you can dump source code, um, gather API keys, credentials, and uh, never going to give you up, never going to let you down, never going to turn around and desert you. For anybody who missed the Rick go on this side here. Okay, all right. I thought that was really funny when I did it. I actually just ran out of bullet points. So cool, that one, it's commonly disabled exec is. It literally says hacks. It contains exec, which is a SAS discovery issue. Um, the request will let you do DAS discovery of the script. Uh, there's no effort to hide actually what the script is doing, and it's noisy in logs. PHP, being the language that it is, has the at sign that you use inside of emails. And what that does is this, if this function or this method creates an error, just ignore it. It's fine, which is just wonderful. It also has a scream operator, which over, uh, overrides the error suppression operator to allow that to kick things to logs. So yeah. So now we got a little bit more obfuscated here. We went ahead and we reversed the string. So C-E-X-E -E backwards is exec. You could also take that secret towards the bottom where the cursor is floating. That's my laser pointer for the day. And that is basically exec and then request hex. So what's cool about that is you're basically using a variable with whatever level of abstraction you want ahead of it to execute a function. That's a little bit harder to find. And there's a lot of different methods that you could use to get that done. So I mean, base64 decode is pretty universally used across malware. I don't know why it is, but it's not a bad function, especially if you're trying to parse in PHP email, which I don't know why you're doing that, but you'll need base64 decode for the bind bodies. Uh, GZ inflate and deflate turns it into binary blobs. Makes it a little bit harder to understand exactly what it's doing. Uh, string reverse, just showed you that one, but then you have string concatenation. So you can see I have an EXEC down here which if you're just parsing things, you're doing a grep across your entire web directory looking for dangerous functions, it's gonna miss that because there's things breaking that string apart. You'd use ASCII encoding. Anybody who built one of those logic analyzers uh, downstairs, really cool, uh, really cool. They're using ASCII to transmit over the Arduino for your logic analyzer to pick up, and that's basically all that is. One, uh, 101 is E, so you got two of those, 120 and 99. You can also just tokenize it. You make it so it's a little bit harder to understand what the function's doing. This function here is just reversing a string. It's not doing anything crazy, but it's pretty damn confusing. So cool, now we have some effort to hide what it's doing from its true purpose. And this is the last one. If you guys are like, dude, like, I get it. You're, you're a web developer, dude, have fun. This is the last one I'm gonna do. So now all I did here was add a little note at the top that this is part of a WordPress uh, parser package. This is a WordPress site. It's reasonable that if you saw that, you'd be like, oh shit, that sounds important. Leave it on there. That's a little fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So cool, we're dissuading modification. So now what we'll do is we'll go ahead and tear down an actual script that was live on the interwebs. So a few tips and tricks of doing this. Uh, I did it during COVID initially while I was happy to, helping this guy out in 2021. And then uh, Michael hit me up and was like, hey, are you gonna come back and do another talk? And I'm, sure. So I had to do it again because I forgot everything I did the first time. So first biggest tip if you wanna do this is use cool bullets in your presentation. Squares are cool, they're cooler than circles, but they're not stars, okay? Will you peel back your files? Yes, you could use GitHub, branches, you store it in different methods. I, I like different files. And the reason I did that is so when y'all decide to pull this GitHub repo, uh, repo down, you could look at the files with notes and say, okay, cool, here's the original and here is how it gets peeled back into the state that it is. Um, you'll, you'll definitely wreck it a few times. You also wanna keep a current text file about what you're doing. If you go on a bender or if you're like me and you have three kids and you're away for days at a time, like diapers and stuff like that, you're gonna forget what you were working on. Run VMs in an isolated testbed uh, environment, if at all possible, or don't, if you don't really want to. Uh, you never know what these scripts are going to do, and they could pull down more malicious stuff than what you've seen. They could send up things to other sites. And while you're doing this, it's a good idea to run lint tests, which is just a syntax check of the actual code, or you go through and run the script and see if it looks the same. Because every time you go and deobfuscate something, if you fat finger something, you're going to break it. People are, wa people are walking out, fight, fire alarm, somebody. Sadness. All right, so I don't know if anybody's seen this movie, mild spoilers, it's like 40 year old movie, shouldn't be too, you know, you should have seen it by now. 
Uh, Christmas story, kid gets a, a letter in the mail, and he, uh, it's got some obfuscation inside there. It's got a uh, replacement cipher. So that was me getting that script. I'm like, cool, let's figure out what this does. So from a high level, I don't expect anybody to understand what this means because it doesn't mean anything. But the point is, is the methods, the functions inside, or the methods and properties inside of this object that were on the server had things that were scary. X64, debug, uh, what else we got? TX, library, right? A bunch of different components in there where a casual observer would see that and think, okay, yeah, don't touch it. It was pretty clever. So first thing I did is I pulled this up and I looked at it. I'm like, cool, this, uh, this file is part of the Apache Software Foundation and it's an MIT license. Real quick, does anybody know what the problem is already? Apache literally has their own licensing framework. They don't use MIT for their software. They have the Apache software licenses, which if you use Apache, you've dealt with that license. Um, but that's creative. That sounds scary, so they left it alone. So they have that inside of there. Plus you have obviously the functions that concern you. What is x86? What is cluster? If somebody knows what that is, I still don't. Um, and then we have the error control operator buried inside of, maybe it's a screenshot, maybe it's a different one. Before I jump further, I will mention that fatal error on the bottom. If anybody is trying to run this code, pull it down from GitHub. Uh, PHP 8 removes a function that this script needs to run. PHP 7 deprecates that PHP 6 doesn't exist, uh, languages, and PHP 5 runs it just fine. So if you're actually looking to run any of this and play with it, that's what you'll need. So first level of deobfuscation, to pull this back and figure out what it's doing, is you see all these different arrays, your check, x64 stable, and so on. All those are just randomly sorted directories of the words. In fact, that word fence report that we saw at the beginning was actually pulling up this create function right, one right here, x64. It saw that, which I was thoroughly impressed with. It wasn't just a simple string match. So went through fixed all these functions inside of the code, got rid of uh, unnecessary code, and so this section started to look more like down here, where we have, okay, cool, create function with that at sign at the beginning, error suppression operator. Got your GZ in flight, error suppression operator once again. And that is just in case you disable those functions, it makes it harder to find that script so it could maybe hobble itself together. It's like limp mode on your cars. Cool, second, second step is removing functions that simply wrap the other functions. So this MV block here was separate from a very large base64 blob that was called library. Somebody can figure out what that is by just looking at it, I'll be impressed, but it's base64 and you can usually tell it by the equals, the pluses and the slashes, and there that pad and shift the base of the character set. Round three is Okay, cool, let's peel back these functions until I can see what MV is. MV was simply that right there. If anybody does uh, some HTML coding, trigger a few people with that, you'll see you got a little block inside here where it's kicking out a body, it's pulling down your HTTP host, it's doing some operations on it, and it's looking for something underscore WI. I promise you that's not a play on Wisconsin. I know we're in Wisconsin, that's what it was called, um, which I thought was pretty great. And so we're pulling down a substring of a SHA-1 hash of that string, and we're grabbing the first 16 digits of it. Okay, so do I just have a command and control side, like a server side of the script that I'm sending things to this? I don't know at this point, but this is kind of interesting. You get down here, text and name, you got your name is underscore WI. Okay, so there's something going on with this, uh, this page. There's a form somewhere. Screw it, let's throw it in the browser and see what happens. It says 404 not found. Now th this is actually a lot trickier than you'd think because as a human you see that and you're like, cool. 404, there's nothing there, a typo. Two problems exist. One is it was putting out a 200 okay on the, on the actual headers. That's actually really clever because if they're scanning for 404s with a sitemap maker or something similar, it's not going to t detect a 404 on their site. They're not gonna go and find that. The other thing is, is it didn't match the server's 404 page. So you knew that there was something going on. Something else was responding for that server at that page. If you hit control and mouse click, it pulls up this box here that, at first I'm like, cool, LS, DIR in case it's a Windows machine, whatever else, go through and see if I can run shell level commands through that, command, through that input box. 
But there was no good way of figuring out what it could do because nothing worked. Everything I tried inside of there just would not execute a command. It wouldn't do anything tricky. It was just white page of death, which if you've done PHP dev work, it's pretty common stuff. So I ran every single word list, word list and password list I could find, did about 10 million attempts against it. And the way I checked it is I took that function, I looked for the library, the really large one I talked about a bit ago, to be decoded for things like PHP or uh, exit or print or echo or any of the common PHP functions to see, cool, did I get this actually broken through one of these 10 million iterations? I didn't, got nothing. I tried password one, I tried putting a, uh, exclamation point, I did you know, spring 2021, I've, I've tried all those things. Still that's my password, I'm just, whatever, don't try it. Uh, but yeah, so we, we got the authentication mechanism, we'll call it, pretty simplified. I understand what it's supposed to do, and this is why I thought this would be a cool talk, is because most malware that you see that's web level doesn't actually have this level of abstraction to or this level of obfuscation. A lot of it is pretty obvious, or a few layers of Base64 and Gzip, they're not using a password to pad strings inside of there. So there's another method inside of there called income, which I do love income uh, very much. It didn't generate any of that for me. So it looped over every character in this large library blob, this base 64 one, converting the ASCII to decimal. So like, you know, lowercase a is 65, or uppercase, it's uppercase. Um, diffed it against a hash version of that SHA-1 16 character password earlier, iterated over that and appended a decimal character after being module 256 back to ASCII. Somebody here is gonna be a lot smarter than me and can tell me why they were doing that. All I know is like that's pretty confusing and I'm impressed. So they were just doing that to basically bury the true source of the code. And the way I figured that out was like, does this iterate over this thousands of times one time? The first time I did it, I kicked it out and I got this over here and that's not necessarily GZ uh, inflated, but probably. But that and that, the character links lined up perfectly. Cool, there's one iteration over this hashing function in order to get that text back. So then I went a little bit further with it to make it a little bit clearer for this con, so if any of y'all wanted to look at that code, it'd be a little bit clearer what you're actually doing with it. Um, not for efficiency, but readability. I also removed some object-oriented programming abstraction that was inside there. It was a procedural script through and through. They just put it in there to confuse you. Uh, it was infected with classitis. I thought I took part of this slide out, but I'm gonna read it now. Um, unnecessary abstraction through object-oriented principles applied to software unlikely to receive updates, maintenance, or shared across teams. I'm not, to, I'm not talking down doing things object-oriented, but when it's a script that you're putting on somebody's server to like host a Bitcoin miner, you, you, effort. You can make it really slim. Um, I threw a little line here about the Atari 2600 because there is a lot of vintage computer things going on here where they actually had to make code so efficient at that time where during the refresh cycle, your vertical refresh rate of the screen, that had that time to execute code before it painted the next screen. If you took too many or too few computer cycles or compute cycles to do that, your screen is being drawn incorrectly. It, so throwing abstraction on top of something like that, you're adding needless padding to it, a bunch of knops in effect. Um, that doesn't apply a lot to PHP, but it's an interesting fact and it kind of ties into abstraction. So yeah, this wasn't abstracted either way. It was there uh, for any of those purposes. It was there to confuse you and make you have to dig a little bit further. Fud yeah. So never give up, never surrender. I did spend a lot of time pulling it back to that point, going through this code, talking to this guy who, I mean, the Redditor who uh, is going to take code and send it to me from his server. It's pretty impressive to start with. And there's a lot of effort to figure out what that does, and I still have no idea. Now, everybody in here knows, because you know what my talk is called, because you're here, and we already called it command and control, but I'm not gonna tell the guy the same thing either, that it's, it's a scary script, it looks confusing, I can't figure it out, I don't know what it did. So what can you do with that? Not that way, that way. It's time to fish, right? We have a script that some attacker expects is going to be up on their web domain, uh, or uh, on the website, that they could use to access this person's machine. So cool, we got our decoder ring in the mail for the folks who are keeping up with the uh, Christmas story references. It didn't take very long at all for this to actually work. This is a legit phishing script that I built and the legit request log that I got back from it. That's a real password, that's the guy's real IP. Somebody works for that ISP, could be like, bro, like, you got phished. 
Um, so all I did was take the HTML body that we used in that first half, throw that up on the server, and anything that got sent to it, whether it was a cookie, whether it was a Git post, we logged that down with the IP and what time it happened. And once we had that, it was pretty easy pickings after that point to figure out what the script actually does. More Christmas story. More Christmas story. Oh, stop playing. Uh, I had to export it as a PDF. This, ki this little kid says an expletive on a, on a uh, 80s television show. That's pretty rare. So cool, we got the library file, this base64 decoded now. Now we can see actually what this is doing. And this is the second time I went through this and Windows Defender decided to say, hey, you got a Trojan on your machine. Yes, allow. It's a work machine anyway, so. Um, <laughs> so you see on the left there that we have a little screenshot of what that kicked out. Now that's not exactly what it kicked out. I don't know how many folks here, you do show of hands if you want, do Python dev over like PHP. Now, I saw one, okay, two. Python loves its line feeds. It loves its line spacing. It spaces and tabs, tabs are better. Um, it loves indentation for control structures. PHP, you can just like spray it on the, uh, on the page. It doesn't care. It's like, yeah, it's fine. So I ran that through a code beautifier, which I feel like I say in a few slides somewhere, maybe, maybe not, maybe, maybe. I'll just talk about it now, and if I get to that slide, it'll be weird. Ran through a code beautifier to make it look a little bit nicer. Everything's indented, everything has the curly braces hanging just the way I like it. And I decided, let's go ahead and execute it. So that's what I got back, is that right there? Has anybody seen this on any of your web apps? All right, there's a few, there are a few hands here. Yeah, so there's nothing super tricky about what that is, at, that is actually doing. It's super powerful but there's nothing crafty. They spent a lot of work to hide basically like a C99 shell equivalent here. So it allows you to do your upload, download, touches, edits, um, view PHP info or your config info. So if you're one of those folks who are like, oh, you're not, I'm not gonna put inside my GitHub repo my database connection credentials. I'm gonna store those instead of a constant that is written to the web server. Well, PHP info tends to puke out every single global var variable inside of it. So now if I could kick run that function, I have credentials to your database, where it's located, hopefully internally, and things can go downhill from there. You also run shell code, so you could you know, run moo or something else, and PHP code. I didn't see anything that phones home or says, hey, here's where the script is at, or any sort of advanced persistent thread, or anything super crazy. So after the fish, uh, yeah, we can't, we can't know exactly what the script is doing at this point. And let's go a little bit deeper into that script. So the first thing I had to do is run through the code beautifier. Everybody remembers that? Nobody's asleep? Okay. And then we saw those weird hexadecimal or octal encoding of different symbols. So you got your single quote, you got your double quote, you got your backslash, and that's what you'll see a lot of times. It had like A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four curly braces. I mean, it was, it was a complete mess, and I was pretty impressed at how long uh, that took. If you're looking to ever back a script like this off, I've learned that these are three of them that you probably don't want to. Because if you back off a single quote in the middle of two single quotes, syntax error. That's why I say lint check. So you can see inside of here we have an INI restore with that uh, error suppression operator, and you have a function exist check. Right there, your INI restore is encoded with both, you got uh, hexadecimal, and a little bit further down we have one that, there. Backslash 151, that's your octal. So it's funny to look at how much effort went into hiding even this layer of code when you're already past phishing the guy after you throw 10 million attempts against his web server. Just the amount of work to get to this and they're still burying things. So moral story, how did this actually happen? So this guy on Reddit uses subcontracting, uh, subcontractor for work they installed pay for plugins that they pirated. Shock. Um, so yeah. So basically what this comes down to is I wanted to more or less inspire folks who get malware detections to just go and go dig a little bit further. It's actually pretty interesting to see what you could find in this, in this stuff. Um, it's probably something you could find somewhere else on GitHub, but it, it's the, the, pair, the tear back part of this is pretty fun. So I might be a little early, talked a little quick there. Yeah, very early. Micro Machines guy over here, fire, fire alarm. Um,
questions, comments, concerns? Want to make fun of me? Anything? Show. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. All right. Well, that's that's a GitHub repo if you want to see what the code looks like. Um, I got a the list of the sec list is the password repo, and we got some PHP shells inside of there, and then a couple of self plugs and a few uh, things that make people angry about Macs and PCs and tabs and spaces. Cool. Well, thank you all for coming.